YouTube and there it is. Okay, there's two things I've got to click on. Okay, we're on YouTube. So it's important to uh, have the YouTube feed tonight because like I say, there's a lot of visuals, a lot of graphics uh, and um, photographs of just about every article tonight has a uh, an image of uh, some sort and uh, perhaps a little video of some sort. We've got uh, the space where the woman tonight with her uh, latest uh, solar report um, coming up and uh, so that's six minutes of uh, uh, of, inter- uh, of educational material so <laughs> so uh, definitely worth uh, uh, tuning into my YouTube channel so we're broadcasting on the prime frequency of 3541 kilohertz in the 80 meter amateur radio band and simulcasting on 160 meters on 1865 kilohertz our medium wave service and uh, we're also via the uh, YouTube channel VK3CSJ uh, so if you go to uh, Google, uh, not Google, YouTube, and uh, type in VK3CSJ and look for the little live, little red live symbol, uh, that'll be me uh, running live as we speak, um, although delayed a little bit uh, to the audio you're hearing direct on uh, HF at the moment. Can't do much about that. Unfortunately, Melbourne television repeater VK3RTV is still currently off air due to maintenance. Um, and... Uh, uh, we're hoping that uh, by next Friday uh, we'll be back uh, on uh, on the Melbourne Digital TV repeater VK3R TV channel one. Alrighty then, um, let's get a move along. Um, the uh, for the for stations tuning in for the first time. Oh, I forgot to mention uh, we also have a, an email address um, VK3EKH at gmail dot com vk3ekh at gmail.com uh, if you wish to uh, send uh, signal reports I'm look at the uh, inbox as I speak and we also have a chat window uh, which can be found via the ASV website at www.asv.org.au look under the uh, radio astronomy tab to uh, where it uh, has the uh, link to the ASV broadcast and that is a separate page altogether and that shows um the YouTube stream. In fact, the YouTube stream is there, and also the uh, chat window. A little link to the Discord chat window uh, from the ASV website. All right, um, and I can see Richard VK3 VRS is already up there on the chat window. So good day, Richard. Uh, and I actually, yes, I should go and turn that down too. Um, Okay, the Astronomical Society of Victoria was founded in 1922 and comprises well over 1,600 members uh, throughout Victoria and the various other states of Australia. Membership of the Society is open to all persons with an interest in astronomy. Society's objectives, of course, is to encourage the study and practice of astronomy and to disseminate the knowledge to its members. Um, Monthly meetings are usually held on the second Wednesday of each month, except in January, where it's held on a Saturday night. Meetings start at 8 p.m. at the Mullia Hall National Herbarium in Burwood Avenue, Melbourne, near the Melbourne Observatory, which is not too far from the Shrine of Remembrance. Parking is available in Burwood Avenue, Dallas Brooks Drive, and uh, the surrounding streets. Admission is free, and visitors are most welcome. Privileges of membership include the right to uh, borrow books and periodicals and publications from the extensive library located at the Melbourne Observatory, receipt of the ASV's magazine called Crux, uh, containing articles, news, observing notes and the like, and a free provision of the Astronomical Yearbook. Access is available to telescopes on members' nights held regularly at Melbourne Observatory and after the monthly meetings weather permitting these instruments include the Society's 300mm equatorial reflector and a 300mm portable reflector. There's also a 200mm refractor, which is managed by the Royal Botanic Gardens, and a photoheliograph are also housed at the observatory and are accessible as well. Society also has a number of 200mm uh, reflectors available for short period loan to members desiring to... Uh, um, yeah, to basically uh, to test and check uh, uh, how, to, how to use telescopes before perhaps making a purchase. Members are also encouraged to make use of the Society's country property located near Heathcote, some 90 minute drive north of Melbourne. Um, uh, yes, there are a range of instruments available for members to use. 
uh, and the larger of those two require appropriate training, uh, which range from 300 millimeters to 1,000 millimeter in aperture. Also located on the site is an 8.5 fully steerable radio telescope, which members can access with involvement to the radio astronomy section. Members are also encouraged to make and use telescopes. Advice and help on both matters are provided willingly to newcomers desiring to do the same. Instrument making is only one of the number of common activities addressed. Um, there's in fact about 20 active sections that make up the uh, various groups of the ASV. Other areas of interest that members can participate in include deep sky observing, astrophotography, uh, lunar and planetary observing, um, in, um, lost my place, uh, ob, uh, observing oral meteor, comet, radio astronomy, computing and cosmology and astrophysics, historical studies and research and astronomy in general. Uh, contact details for various section directors are provided in the yearbook, uh, but uh, you need to become a member of the ASV to get the yearbook, so my suggestion would be to explore the website at www.asv.org.au and all will be revealed. Um, okay, and uh, also to note that ASV will conform to all government health directives. Um, ASV events may be required to be cancelled, moved or postponed. So all that information can be found on the ASV website at www.asv.org.au on the homepage. Uh, lots of things coming up. And in fact, uh, next weekend, I think it is, um, was it the weekend after? I think it's the Melbourne Cup weekend anyway. Um, uh, there is a, um, a big uh, do happening uh, over at uh, Sea Lake uh, in uh, north um, northwest uh, uh, Victoria, hopefully uh, the, any flooding won't be an issue. <laughs> um, but this event is at this stage going to go ahead. But it's called the Sea Lake Astro Fest 2022, and uh, it's happening up at uh, Sea Lake uh, over the weekend of uh, the Melbourne Cup weekend. So uh, uh, I'm not certain if uh, if. Uh, if it's been booked out at this stage, uh, but uh, certainly all the information about the Sea Lake Astro Fest uh, can be uh, is available on the homepage of the ASV. Uh, so uh, there are various links there and uh, contacts. So if you want to find out more information about it, uh, by all means go via that uh, homepage. Uh, okay, all right. This is VK3 EKH. Uh, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria with the regular Friday night broadcast. Okay, um, I'll go straight into this uh, news item uh, that's uh, come through. Uh, g'day Don, uh, VK3HDX. <sighs> coffee, coffee, coffee. And uh, <laughs> and there's a super picture of me up on the screen there. <laughs> uh, g'day Rob, VK3XRA. He's uh, joined in there on the... Um, on the chat window and he's got a he's taken a still shot of me up on the big screen um on his wall there so um and g'day brett vk2 cbd he's also joined there on the chat window all righty then um now uh on a sad note here um astronaut jim mcdivitt commander of nasa's first spacewalk dies at age 93 it's not bad innings uh, in the 1960s, McDivitt played a pivotal role in several early NASA triumphs, including the first spacewalk and the first crewed orbital flight of the Apollo Lunar Module. And I've just got a picture there of him, so I'll just bring that up. There he is. There's actually a few images I'll have to go through in this quick article. Um, okay, in that picture you're seeing there on, on YouTube, uh, the as astronaut Rusty uh, Schuchart, took this photo of Jim McDivitt inside the lunar module, Spider, uh, several days into the Apollo 9 mission. Uh, McDivitt's uh, burgundy beard reflects the fact that it wasn't until Apollo 10 that crews began shaving in space. <laughs> James or Jim McDivitt, a former astronaut who commanded NASA's first spacewalk during the Gemini 4 mission, and later passed on a chance to land on the moon to become a program manager for 
five Apollo missions uh, died Thursday, October 13, 2022. McDivitt was 93 years old. For an astronaut who played a pivotal role in America's first spacewalk during Gemini 4 in 1965, uh, James Alton McDivitt showed little outward sign of budding genius in his youth. The retired Air Force Brigadier General and two-time space traveller instead discovered his lifelong love for aviation amid the horrors of aerial combat. Born in Chicago, Illinois, on June 10, 1929, McDivitt was a son of an electrical engineer and a progeny of a staunchy Roman Catholic family. He was schooled in Kalamazoo, Michigan, before working for a year fixing furnaces. One went to junior college while it was his I not one. I went to junior college while I got a scholarship to Michigan State, McDivitt said in a NASA Johnson Space Center oral history interview in 1999. He says, I didn't have enough money to go there, so I had to go back to work. With aspirations to become a novelist or explorer, McDivitt joined the Air Force one day after the Korean War broke out. Military life suited him. He had never before boarded an aircraft, never been off the ground, he said but was picked for flight training. During the war, he flew 145 combat shorties or sorties, uh, winning three distinguished flying crosses and a clutch of five air medals. And there's just another photo here of him in his uh, uniform. There he is. Um, the Air Force assigned him to fighter squadrons in Maine and in New Jersey. Then in 1957, they sent McDivitt to the University of Michigan for an aeronautical engineering degree and in New Jersey. Then in 1957, they sent McDivitt to the University of Michigan for an aeronautical engineering degree. I got my sentences mixed up, mixed up just then. While there, he met a master's student in the same field. Ed White McDivitt shone as a straight A student graduating first in his 607 strong class. Struth. He attended Air Force Test Pilot School at Edwards Air Force Base in California, qualifying along with White in 1959. They lived a block and a half apart in Anorn Abor, Michigan, where he he was the best friend uh, I ever had, McDivitt said to, to White. Uh, the pair were among nine astronauts selected by NASA in September 1962. That impressive group also included future luminaries such as Neil Armstrong and Jim Lovell. Standing six feet tall and called Whippet Lean by Time magazine in September 1962, McDivitt worked on the two-man Gemini spacecraft which was an in, intended to set uh, to test rendezvous docking and spacewalking procedures before Apollo before Project Apollo took aim at the moon there's another picture here to bring up uh, there it is this is on board the Gemini I think uh, McDivitt here in this picture you're seeing on YouTube right now McDivitt right and Ed White sit inside the cramped Gemini 4 capsule just prior to liftoff. Uh, McDivitt and White uh, were assigned to Gemini 4, uh, a planned seven-day mission that was to surpass uh, the five days spent in space by Soviet cosmonaut Valery um, Bioski in June 1963. But their record-breaking hopes evaporated when difficulties certifying Gemini's four electrical generating fuel cells shortened the planned flight time to a battery-powered of four days. At dinner one night, McDivitt told his children, aged five, seven and eight, about the upcoming mission, hoping to ignite their excitement. His eldest son, non chanantly replied that he had already heard the news at school. His daughter responded likewise. Then his youngest son thought for a moment before piping up and saying, Dad, there's a fly in the milk bottle. 
<laughs> McDivitt and White launched from Pad 19 at Cape Kennedy in Florida at 10.16 a.m. EDT on June 3, 1965. Though, he short, though the shortened flight time was disappointing, Gemini 4 was packed with medical experiments, tests and other junk, McDivitt remarked with studied indifference. At one pass conference, once sorry, at one press conference, McDivitt joked that only a four-day supply of food for two normal people could fit inside the cramped Gemini spacecraft. Without missing a beat, backup crewman Jim Lovell wisecracked, saying, and these two ain't normal. Another st- stroke of fortune saw Soviet cosmonaut Alexei Alonov uh, make the world's first spacewalk in March 1965. I think that's this picture here. No. Um, NASA had penciled in a short session of extra vehicle activity, EVA, uh, for Gemini 5, but in response to Lemonov's achievement, that spacewalk was hastily advanced to Gemini 4. And here's a picture of that, which I'll bring up. Uh, where are we here? There it is. So that there is the under the command of Jim McDivitt, Ed White became the first American to step outside a spacecraft on June 3rd, 1965, uh, during the uh, Gemini 4 mission. Okay, Uh, carried out by Ed White and lasting some 20 minutes, the spacewalk evened the score with the Soviets and set the stage for future NASA spacewalks. In this NASA oral history interview, McDivitt said, it probably wasn't until after the flight that we really began to appreciate the fact that working outside a spacecraft was a lot different than working inside the spacecraft. Gemini 4 became America's longest space flight so far, but four days in space pro- pro- um, proved challenging, with leftover food containers and excrement bags hardly conducive to conforming uh, comfortable living. Spaghetti rehydrated via water pistol and wax, wax tasting sandwiches and a Roman Catholic fish dish offered sustenance, but little else. Daily hygiene involved mopping faces with damp cloths. And as Gemini 4 headed near its end, a bearded McDivitt uh, um, uh, queried that he felt pretty darn woolly. And I can imagine that. After returning to Earth and setting foot on the deck of the space of, of the aircraft carrier Wasp on June 7, McDivitt whooped, whooped with delight. Whooped with delight. Okay. Both men were healthy and negating doctors' fears that NASA might wind up with two unconscious astronauts after four weightless days. So, Apollo 9 preparing for a moon landing. McDivitt next helped with the development and testing of the lunar module, LM, a bug-like craft that would ferry future Apollo explorers to the moon's surface. Teamed with astronauts David Scott and Rusty Squickhart, McDivitt dove into training for a low Earth orbit test flight of the entire Apollo spacecraft, the LM command module. Following the Apollo 1 fire in January 1967, missions were correspondingly renumbered and McDivitt's crew found themselves appointed at Apollo 8. But Riding a wave of confidence after the maiden flight of the Saturn IV moon rocket, NASA decided to fly Apollo 8 around the moon in December 1968 with astronauts Frank Borman, Jim Lovell and Bill Anders. McDivitt and crew was reassigned to Apollo 9. And after several days delay at 11am EDT on March 3, 1969, the Saturn V roared uh, uh, aloft from Cape Kennedy's Pad 39A. Over the course of the next 10 days, in what space historian Andrew Chalkin called a test piloting bonanza, McDevitt, Scott and Squahart uh, rung out the entire Apollo system. Rung out the entire Apollo system. McDevitt and Squ- Squahart, and I'm not pronouncing that right, I know that, um, undocked the LM named Spider from CM Grum, Gumdrop and withdrew to 183 kilometers. They tested the LM's throttle, throttle bubble descent engine and digital autopilot. 
with Squahart, who had suffered acute space sickness early in the mission, made a spacewalk wearing the Apollo lunar space su- uh, surface suit. On the final night of Apollo 9, McDivitt privately told Scott that he had intended to retire from the astronaut corpse. He says, It was apparent to me that I wasn't going to be the first guy to land on the moon, McDivitt later said in an oral history. And he says that, um, and being the second or third guy wasn't that important to me. There's another picture here, too, of these guys. Okay. Um, in this group here, you've got. Uh, from left, uh, uh, Rusty uh, Squahart, Squish Cart Hart, uh, David Scott, uh, and Jim McDivitt walk on the uh, the deck uh, of the uh, aircraft carrier after ten days of weightlessness flight. In September 1969, McDivitt uh, became manager of Apollo spacecraft program office, and uh, a post he held until April 1972. McDivitt went on to oversee the planning and execution of all but the last lunar landing mission, retiring from NASA in September 1972. With McDivitt's passing, the world has lost another member of the Apollo generation who paved a road to the moon and a half a century ago, a road that uh, Artemis generation will surely follow later this decade. McDivitt was the first of only a handful of American astronauts to serve as commander of their uh, very first space mission, when McDivitt was asked by NASA oral historian why he thought that uh, why he thought that was, he responded was his response was simple. Well, I was the best looking astronaut there was, McDivitt, McDivitt said, uh, with a, a worry smile, and so it, they picked him picked him on the looks there. Ah <laughs> uh, dear, so there it is. Um, uh, another astronaut uh, bites the dust and uh, 93 um, so it's a, a shame but there it is alright um, bring up my camera ok this is VK3 uh, EKH the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria and uh, just waiting for that coffee to kick in I need it right now. Okay, um, next is... Um, oh, okay. Um, now, I mentioned last week uh, that I was going to... Um, uh, um, going along to uh, uh, to see Prof- Professor, well, uh, Professor Brian Cox. Um, he was uh, at the Melbourne um, um, Entertainment Centre. I keep forgetting what it's called. Uh, it's a horrible place to walk around, <laughs> but I, I guess once you've been there a couple of times, you get get a bit of a hang of it. But I was totally lost in trying to find door one. I, I started at something like door nineteen, and uh, I was really racing against time because the the session started at two thirty Saturday afternoon, and um, I'd forgotten that parking was going to be pretty much non-existent. Uh, so uh, I was a bit under stress to try and get into the hall uh, without missing anything. Fortunately, because people were still arriving, they decided to um, to uh, delay uh, the beginning of the session um, with uh, Brian by 15 minutes. So I uh, sat down in the, the one seat that I had and, uh, and relaxed. Uh, but uh, I'll, what I'll do is I'll, I'll play this. Um, this is a, a kind of a, um, uh, a promo of... Um, of Brian's uh, new current Horizons tour that he's doing uh, around the world, and uh, it just goes for about a minute. So uh, I'll cut it short because there's a lot of uh, things at the end that don't, don't need to uh, to go across. But um, if you're watching YouTube, uh, this is uh, the Brian Cox promo promo thing for his um, his um, current uh, world. Uh, lecture tour that he's doing, although it's more, more he claims it's more of a, he should be, he should be, he reckons he should be calling it a show rather than a lecture. <laughs> anyway, let's see if this uh, works for us. Professor Brian Cox, Horizons, a 21st century space odyssey, live on stage, using state of the art LED screen technology. Theatres and arenas will be filled with images of faraway galaxies, 
alien worlds, supermassive black holes, and a time before the Big Bang. What is the nature of space and time? Why does the universe exist? How did life begin? How rare might it be? And what is the significance of life in the cosmos? Whether an avid science reader or a total novice, Horizons will make the latest science accessible. Touring April through June. Tickets from profbriancock.live. See you there. There it is there, and uh, I saw that promo uh, a, a couple of months ago, and I thought, well, uh, I've got to go and, and see that because um, uh, I, um, I'm just fiddling around with the headphones here. Just bear with me until I get my audio here sorted out because uh, I've got the headphones on, uh, so I'm, I'm hearing things all over the place here. But um, anyway, uh, I've got a... a the particular stadium stage that uh, Brian was sitting, working on, um, had a, a really, really big widescreen uh, screen, a projector screen, and um, I was suitably impressed. I mean, I've, I've been to uh, um, IMAX a few times now, and of course that's a, well, that's a big screen, <laughs> uh, but that's for a purpose. Um but uh, this this was a really wide screen. It it must have been. Uh, it was the full stage length, and uh, it it would have been. Um, uh, I, I would say probably in, uh, close to eighty meters, uh, maybe uh, across the stage. This huge uh, screen, and uh, all the graphics uh, that um, uh, uh, Brian had to show during his presentation were all four K uh, presentation. In fact, the image I'll put up right now. Uh, that you can see there, that that just gives you a, an example of um, the kind of imagery uh, that uh, Brian had uh, in in behind him while he's on stage talking about uh, about astronomy, and uh, the the visual effects uh, behind him were quite uh, quite uh, compelling. And these are all real images too, uh, taken from um, well, at least most of them were real images taken from uh, from Hubble and um, uh, also uh, James Webb. And um, and he, and of course some very good computer graphics as well. Uh, there's another image here, for instance. Have a look at this one. So uh, it, now the, the camera there is focused on on Brian, but uh, so the the image behind him is a little bit blurry. But you can imagine that uh, uh, you know while sitting in the in the uh, stage and in, in the audience that um, you're you feel it blown away with uh, the special effects, so to speak. Um, but uh, anyway, um, uh, his main emphasis uh, really was um, uh, on uh, black holes. He uh, he wanted to talk about uh, how uh, the the concept of black holes, uh, the history of uh, its uh, the the, um, uh, the uh, concepts that have uh, come up for, through time. Uh, having a look, talking about Einstein and and Stephen Hawkins and. Um, uh, a lot of that, and he actually, <laughs> he actually had a little tablet that he was uh, using to to write onto the screen. So as he wrote on the tablet, on his hand, the the printing would come out straight away on the screen. And there was a little bit of mathematics there as well. So, you know, you had to be interested in astronomy. You you, you would have had to have known something about astronomy to um, to have accepted um, uh, that uh, two hour. Uh, presentation that uh, Brian did, um, and th the fact that the the, the stage or the sta the hall was pretty well booked out uh, indicated that a lot of people were were fond of uh, of uh, Cox's work and the documentaries that uh, he's uh, he's um, he's done through BBC Horizons and and such things. So you know um, I, I'm you know if Carl Sagan uh, had have been doing world tours on the grand scale as Brian, um, I would have loved to have seen Carl Sagan, uh, but Sagan wasn't quite um, doing the same thing Brian did uh, is doing now. But um, uh, the fact that I never got a chance to see Carl Sagan in person like this, <laughs> I figured this is a once in a lifetime thing. Um, so it was really good to see Professor Brian Cox in the flesh doing his thing, and uh, it was really quite uh, quite a good uh, two hours. Um, 
And uh, yeah, anyway, that's my review. Oh, well, when I talk about a review, I did have a review here. Um, uh, what time is it? See, it's already after 10.30. How quick it goes. All right, this, this is a review by Digital Journal. Uh, I don't know what Digital Journal is. I'll just go with it, though. Um, Horizons uh, A 21st Century Space Odyssey is a fascinating live experience by Professor Brian Cox. Uh, on April 26, Horizons, a 21st century space odyssey starring Professor Brian uh, Cox, CBE, was fascinating and exhilarating. It took place at the iconic Beacon Theatre in the heart of New York City. Uh, the internationally recognised physicist was able to explore space and time with visually striking and thrilling elements that captured the interest of both amateur scientists and experts. His popular North American tour is produced by the Web, uh, Web Westbeth uh, Entertainment Group. With Horizons, he, he is able to take viewers on an educational, scientific and cinematic journey. It is a story of how we came to be, as well as where we can, uh, where, uh, as well as what we can become. He utilizes state-of-the-art LED screens and other technology, so he is able to create faraway galaxies, black holes, and other galactic worlds, as well as time that excited prior to the Big Bang. The deepest of questions were explored and pondered using the latest advances in our understanding of quantum theory, black holes, biology, planetary science, astronomy and cosmology. The musical score was stirring and evoked a wide spectrum of emotions. <laughs> Brian Cox uh, was joined by award-winning comedian Robin Nice, nice in I-N-C-E, uh, who was the co-host of The Infinite Monkey Cage and was impressive in his own right. Uh, but uh, most importantly, Horizons, a 21st century space odyssey, is a celebration of our civilization, music, art, philosophy, and science. Moreover, it is a hopeful vision of our future if we continue to explore nature with humility, humility and if we continue to live to, to value ourselves and our fellow human beings. Um, and uh, okay, the, the verdict. There's one more here. Overall, Horizons, a 21st century space odyssey, was a spectacular live show that should be experienced by all. Science was alive and well in New York City. This odyssey was timely, relevant, and huge uh, wake-up call for the public. Professor Brian Cox was able to command the stage the entire time. His presentation skills were top-notch and scientific information he provided with throughout the evening was food for thought, stimulating and engaging. He was able to, to move his audience on both an intellectual as well as emotional level and is highly recommended uh, that one sees him live when he comes to town. Uh, grab some popcorn or drinks, sit back and be prepared to have your minds blown by Professor Brian Cox's immerse, immersive sh live show. It was raw, authentic and profoundly compelling. Wow. Professor Cox is the epitome of grace, class and sophistication and an entire production is utterly fantastic. Um, I'm just going to leave it there because <laughs> it's just, <laughs> that's just really giving him such a, a, a rap. But um uh, anyway, um, unfortunately, there were, there were only I think there were only t the two uh, shows here in Melbourne, and um, um, I'm not sure where he's moved on to at this stage. Uh, whether he's still in Australia or uh, uh, heading on his tour somewhere else. But anyway, look, I I found it fascinating. Um, I, I, like I say, I, I missed seeing Carl Sagan. Uh, Brian Cox to me is the is the the modern day Carl Sagan, and uh, I was just glad to see the guy in the flesh because I've seen all his documentaries, and uh, he's uh, he's just got a there's just something about him that's uh, you know interesting. All right, enough of that. Um, Sky Notes. Now um, this weekend is meteors, uh, ironids. Ironids. The Ironids are visible from the 15th to the 29th, but peak. I've got a graphic here to show too. Uh, was my graphic of this? There it is. Getting back to uh, the subject at hand. Um, <coughs> the Ironids are visible from the 15th to the 29th, but peak on the 21st and the 22nd, which is this weekend, with estimates of around 30 meteors per hour. Um, the best time will be from around midnight to early dawn. The shower is centred on Orion the Hunter near the red supergiant star Betelgeuse. Uh, these meteors are typically very fast and bright. 
they the they enter the atmosphere at about 66 kilometers a second and vaporize uh, and vaporize full stop oh sorry no they vaporize 100 kilometers above the surface leaving persistent trails in the sky uh, the conversation has detailed guide by Dr. Tanya Hill and Professor Jonty Horner. But anyway, there's a, the graphic you're seeing on my YouTube channel right now shows um, the constellation of Orion and um, roughly uh, where the, the radiant of the Ironids Ar- Ar- will be uh, appearing in the sky towards the east there. So uh, hopefully the clouds will clear enough for a little bit of uh, visibility on the on that side of things but i've got a feeling it won't you're tuned to asv radio vk3 ekh um we have oops what did they do i'm oh, sorry I just lost the whole screen for a minute um email address if you wish to send reports uh, vk3 ekh at asv radio uh, sorry um vk3 ekh at gmail.com vk3 ekh at gmail.com if you wish to send uh, reports to the signal tonight uh okay what's the next thing i've got here because I'm, I'm running out of time now um oh yeah this is this is a short article um a question was asked if the universe is expanding uh, why will the milky way and andromeda galaxies collide and i must admit i have thought the same thing how, how can massive objects in in the universe like our milky way galaxy and andromeda actually seemingly be on a path of for a a collision uh when apparently the universe is expanding um well um the the universe is expanding but galaxies near each other can still interact at least for now uh and i've got a graphic here of this too just a a kind of a a, um not a Oh, yeah, kind of an artist's impression. Um, there it is there, our galaxies. It's sometime in the future. That's how the sky is going to look. Um, as uh, as pointed out, the universe is expanding, carrying the galaxies inside it away from each other like raisins inside rising bread dough. This means that one day, far in the future, inhabitants of our galaxy will not see any galaxies in the night sky. That doesn't mean that galaxies that are near to one another still don't re- interact or won't interact, however. Just as Earth's gravity might pull on a nearby asteroid, sending it on a collision course with our planet, the Andromeda and Milky Way galaxies interact with each other gravitationally. This has resulted in the two galaxies falling toward each other at a rate of about 37 miles per second, or 60 kilometers per second. Because Andromeda is 2.5 million light years away, uh, with uh, one light year equivalent to 5.9 trillion miles or 9.5 trillion kilometers, this galactic crash won't occur for 4.5 billion years. And thankfully, the space between stars is so great uh, that it is unlikely anything will truly collide. But the merger will change the path of stars within each galaxy. As it turns out, a majority of the Milky Way halo was formed by emerging a numerous progenitor galaxies, according to a paper published in the Astrophysical Journal early this year. Though the exact number of times our galaxy has merged with another is unclear, what is clear is that the Andromeda collision won't be the first time the Milky Way has merged with another galaxy, nor will it be the last. Our galaxy is part of a galaxy cluster known as the Local Group. One day, this collection of nearly 100 galaxies may have all merged, and there's even evidence that the Local Group might itself merge uh, with the closest large galaxy cluster, the Virgo Cluster. So there's a nice little short article that I thought was appropriate to read out. Um, This is VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel. Um, Okay... A uh, little report here on NASA, uh, the DART um, 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 situation. And there's a graphic here for that. Okay, this article, Hubble Space Telescope sees unexpected twin tails from NASA's asteroid impact 16 hours ago. Uh, published 16 hours ago, that is. The image you're seeing on the screen, a Hubble Space Telescope image, shows two tails streaming from asteroid Demimorphos, uh, which the DART DART spacecraft impacted on September 26 this year. 
A week or two after NASA's spacecraft slammed into the asteroid, scientists have spotted something unexpected. The space rock has grown two tails. The double asteroid redirection test, DART, mission walloped a small asteroid in called Demimorphos uh, on September 26 to test the potential technique of projecting Earth um, protecting, sorry, protecting Earth from an asteroid on a collision course with our planet. Within two days, radiation pressure from the sun pushed the the impact uh, debris into a tail like that of a comet, some 10,000 kilometers long. But now, a new image from the Space Hubble telescope shows Demimorphos has sprouted not one but two tails, a development NASA's personal called unexpected in a statement. If the asteroid itself is center of a clock, a dart became came in from ten o'clock. I'll just say repeat that. If the asteroid itself is the center of a clock, dart came in from ten o'clock. The bright lines at one o'clock, seven o'clock, and ten o'clock aren't debris. These are diffraction spikes caused by Hubble's optics. Uh, the two tails appear at 2 o'clock and 3 o'clock according to a statement from the European Space Agency partner on the Hubble mission. The second tail developed sometime between October 2 and 8. The NASA statement notes, Hubble has, has observed the asteroid 18 times since the impact. Astronomers have seen similar twin tails develop in comets, so the development isn't a total surprise. Still, scientists aren't sure exactly how the second tail formed, according to NASA. The fact that Demimorphos lost enough material to form such a large tail reflects the severity of the impact. The DART mission's main goal was to measure how much time the collision cut from Demimorphos' orbit around a large asteroid named Dimimos, Didymos. The mission was required to shorten the uh, the orbit originally 11 hours and 55 minutes by 73 seconds, although scientists estimated before arrival that the change would have been as much as tens of minutes. Instead, the orbit was or has shortened by 32 minutes, mission personnel announced earlier this month. So uh, definitely the course of the asteroid has been altered due to the impact. This is VK3EKH, ASV Radio, with the regular Friday night broadcast at almost a quarter to 11. Uh, okay, just checking the length of this article, it's not too long. Um, uh, right, now this one here, <coughs> James Webb Space Telescope spies galaxies merging around a monster black hole. Hole. And of course, there's a little graphic here as well. So I'll just bring that up too. What you're seeing on the screen there is a Hubble, a Hubble Space Telescope image on the left shows the region scientists studied. On the right uh, is data from the James Webb Space Telescope shows where material is moving toward Earth blue and away in the red. Classic case of the Doppler. Astronomers have discovered a, cl a cluster of galaxies merging around a rare red quasar, a monster supermassive black hole that is greedily, greedily feeding on gas and other material. An international team of scientists made the surprising discovery as they were using the James Webb Space Telescope to stare billions of years back in time. The finding represents an opportunity to observe how uh, early galaxies merged, forming the universe as we see it today. The blindingly bright quasar and extremely red quasar, qu quasar known as SDSS J165202.64 plus 172852.3, and I want you to remember that because I'm going to play a little quiz on that towards the end of this. <laughs> No, not really. uh, is about 11.5 billion years old and one of the most powerful ever seen from such a tremendous distance away. According to the researchers who describe it as a black hole in formation, we think something dramatic is about to happen in these systems. Um, um, Andre Valner, a research co-author and astrophysicist at the John Hopkins University, Maryland, said in a statement, the galaxy is, at this perfect moment in its lifetime, about to transform and look in entirely different in a few billion years, he reckons. 
So earlier observations of this region of space using the Hubble Space Telescope uh, and the Gemini North Telescope in Hawaii uh, had revealed the quasar had hinted at a galaxy in transition transitional phase, but it was only further observation with JWST that revealed not one, but at least three galaxies all swirling around the quasar. With previous images, we thought we saw hints that the galaxy was possibly interacting with other galaxies on a path to a merger because their shapes get distorted in the process, and we thought we may be uh, that we may have seen, seen that. Um, uh, but after we got JWST, JWST data, the uh, investigator said, uh, "I was like, I have no idea what." what we're even looking at here and is all what is all this stuff they are saying we spent several weeks just staring and staring at these images the scientists did uh, the JWST images of the region also showed that the three galaxies are moving incredibly quickly suggesting the presence of tremendous mass which leads the team to think that this could be the densest area of the galaxy formation ever seen in the early universe even a dense knot of dark matter isn't sufficient to explain it. Um, we think we could be seeing a region where two massive halos of dark matter are merging together. And uh, uh, one of the guys, uh, one of the scientists is saying that uh, who had imaged the observing uh, observation of this quasar with JWST as much as a decade ago was shocked at the space telescope which only started sending science images back to earth in july uh, has produced observations of the the region with such clarity it really will transform our understanding of this object he said the team will now attempt to follow up the observations of this unexpected galaxy cluster hoping to decipher the secrets of how much density dense groupings of the galaxies formed in the early universe and how this process is affected by supermassive black holes that lurk at their hearts and i'll leave that there so that's uh, that's an article from space.com published 19 hours ago called james webb space telescope spies galaxies merging around a black hole monster or a monster black hole <laughs> uh dear I had to uh, skip over a few names. That's what sort of uh, stuffed me up with the, the way that went because I just didn't want to be bothered pronouncing weird surnames. I don't know why people just can't have normal surnames. Um, all right. So this is VK3 EKH. Um, we're coming up to 10.2. <sighs> this is a short article and it's got a very interesting uh, simulation simulation on it. And I shall just key that up. In fact, I'll bring up the, the graphic they've got here first before the simulation. There it is. Um, again, uh, if you're missing part of the story here, go to the YouTube channel, my YouTube channel, VK3CSJ on YouTube. Look for the live little live uh, tag so that you can catch up with the visual uh, aspect to the broadcast tonight or every Friday night, I should say. What you're looking at there um, is a... Uh, the moon may have formed just hours after a giant impact. New new simulations simulations show that the moon may have coalesced within hours of a catastrophic uh, Thea Earth collision that took place billions of years ago, October twenty. <laughs> The moon, in fact, this, that picture you're seeing there is, is a new simulation to show the moon forming within a few hours of the Earth, the, the uh, collision outlined in the giant impact hypothesis. The, moon's Earth, the moon is Earth's constant companion, but as ambiguous as Luna may seem, Earth hasn't always had a moon. Some four and a half billion years ago, when the solar system was still forming, a wandering Mars-sized body named Thea, T-H-E-I-A, slammed into a fledgling moonless Earth. Traditionally, it is thought that this Thea-Earth collision spewed gas around our planet, which gradually coalesced to form the moon. This theory for now, or sorry, this theory for, for how the moon formed is known, Pardon me, as the giant impact hypothesis. 
and uh, but there are a few problems with the giant impact hypothesis as it stands the most glaring being the similarities between lunar rocks and earth's mantle when the apollo astronauts brought back samples from the moon scientists found that their isotopic signatures chemical clues that point to where and how they were created closely but not perfectly matched earth Thus, since no other body in the solar system so sharply resembles Earth's rocks, it is likely that much of the material making up the Moon came from our planet. But in the debris disk scenario of the giant impact hypothesis, it is, it is material from Thea that cons constituted most of the debris that would eventually form the Moon, and alternatively, exp and alternative explanations often struggled to explain the Moon's current orbit. However, new simulations from scientists at Durham University's Institute of Computational Cosmology point to a tweet scenario in which the Moon formed immediately following the Thea collision. In fact, the simulations show the Moon might have formed in, a mere, in mere hours, which is far quicker than previously thought. Now, I'll just play this simulation, so watch the... Um, the screen for this nice little it goes for one 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 minute and fifty one seconds, and uh, there it goes. Um, oh, what are you doing? Okay, all right, just uh, and uh, you can see it happening on the screen there. Um, I wasn't too sure if there was. Oh, there is. Hang on a sec. There is, there is a soundtrack there. The, uh, the sound effects. I'll just go back to microphone <laughs> and uh, let, that, let, let that video run. Uh, okay, so uh, um, just, just doing something here in the shake just to help me with me for a tick. I'm just making sure my uh, my oops my uh, 160 meter transmitter is happy. All right, going back to uh, my headphones here. All right. <coughs> <clears throat> so, um, that was too high. Uh, so, um, this of uh, course opens up a whole new range of possible possible uh, starting places for the moon's evolution, said author Jacob uh, at the NASA's press, re press, re press release. Um, they say here that um, uh, the team modelled the Thea Earth collision approximately 400 times using smooth particle hydrodynamics in their numeral simulations. This method, commonly deployed for simulations for giant impacts, enables scientists to model particles under the influence of both gravity and pressure. Previously, hundreds of thousands of millions of particles were used to simulate the formation of the Moon, but these new simulations utilised up to to a hundred million particles, making them uh, some of the most detailed yet. Uh, the extra computational power showed that at lower resolutions, researchers missed out uh, on the crucial behaviours that occur in such collisions. And he says that we went into the into this project not knowing exactly what the outcomes of these high resolution emulations would be. So on top of the big eye opener that standard resolutions can give you misleading answers, it was extra exciting that the new resolute the new results could include a tantalizing moon-like satellite in orbit. Um, in their direct formation simulations, the, the team was able to produce a moon with a wide orbit and an interior that isn't completely molten. Together with these attributes could help explain the moon's tilted orbit and relatively thin crust. However intriguing, the simulations are still unable to explain everything we know about the moon. Namely, the new simulations were able to form a moon composed of 60% Earth material. But that still isn't enough to explain the extreme isotopic similarities between Earth and the Moon. Even a, even a clump with 60% proto-Earth material, with the re remainder from Thea, would still be expected to produce a much larger Earth-Moon iso iso 
isotopic difference uh, than we than what we see. Um, and while the paper suggests that material from both Thea and Earth may not have thoroughly mixed in the quickly forming moon, creating a gradient of Earth-like material closer to the surface, Canup says that 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 isn't very likely. Uh, for any portion of the moon that forms intact, there is no opportunity for mixing between the pro proto lunar and the uh, most and post-impact Earth material to remove such compositional differences. I'll just leave that article there. I think um, that's on astronomy.com. You can catch up with that. Um, so it's a very interesting little simulation uh, going on, on there, which is just looped at the moment, and uh, I haven't really seen it until now. So <laughs> the whole thing. Anyway, there it is. Okay, so um, you can catch up with, like I say, you can catch up with that article on astronomy.com, um, and uh, under the news tab, and look for the moon may have formed just hours after the giant impact. Okay, well, we're coming up to the hour, and I still haven't, um, I still had uh, a couple of other things there, but I'm, I'm going to run uh, Tamitha's uh, latest uh, space weather report. So let me just uh, cue that up. There she is. And I think if I press that button there. Um, yep, we'll get, that, <laughs> we'll get that sorted out. All right, stand by for Tamitha. This was just runs for six minutes. So this is the latest uh, space weather report from Tamitha Scove. We have some gorgeous eye candy on the sun's west limb, and some fast solar wind is coming round the bend. Those stories and more in the news this week. This space weather forecast is sponsored in part by Millersville University. Come get certified in broadcast space weather. Visit millersville.edu slash swen. Space weather this week remains a bit on the calm side as we take a look at our Earth-facing disk. Look in the south late on the 14th into the 15th. You can see that solar storm launch. That solar storm is actually going south and west of Earth, and it's actually going beneath Earth right now as we speak, not really giving us much of an impact. But as we take a look at the rest of the disk, look up in the north. Do you see that massive prominence? My goodness, this thing is like this big tornado, and it just lasts and lasts through the 15th, the 16th and into the 17th before the thing finally collapses. So that was some gorgeous eye candy that we got to watch for a little while. Meanwhile, as we take a look at the rest of the disk, we do have a small coronal hole that's been rotating in through the Earth strike zone now. Again, not much of an effect because it's just not giving us that much uh, fast solar wind. But look down in the south, we have a much larger coronal hole. This one is going to be rotating into the Earth strike zone in and around four to five days. And judging by the shape of it, it's going to cause fast solar wind to slam on really fast. So aurora photographers, you could definitely have us get bumped to storm levels, which you might bring aurora clear down to mid latitudes for a short while. But sadly, this coronal hole is not the right polarity to give us an extended show. So you're gonna, if you're gonna catch it, you're gonna have to catch it quickly because it will likely die down reasonably quickly. Now, as we take a look at our far-sighted sun, this is stereo A and it's looking at the sun just a little bit from the side. You can see region 3120 as it rotates kind of to the sun's west limb in stereo's view and just behind it you can see that big coronal hole that's the coronal hole that's going to be giving us a, a show in about four or five days from the fast solar wind but look past it you actually see some regions in the south and a little bit of brightness on the east limb in the north these are regions 3105 3107 3111 and 3113 if anybody can remember that far back about a month ago these regions do look like they've quieted down a little bit, so I don't think we're going to be seeing a lot of flare activity or solar storm activity from them, but they are continuing to boost that solar flux, so even as they rotate into Earth view over the next couple days, it looks like uh, the solar flux will stay up in the, in the good range, and so that means radio propagation on Earth's day side is going to be A-OK. -okay. Switching to our moon, we are now passing through the third quarter phase on our way to a new moon, with the new moon being on the 25th. So you night sky watchers, if you want to catch those dim objects in the sky, well, now is your perfect chance. 
Switching to our solar storm conditions and aurora possibilities over the coming week, we do have that small coronal hole that's rotating in through the Earth's strike zone, and it should be giving us a small pocket of fast solar wind. At high latitudes, NOAA is expecting active conditions, but we do have up to about a 45% chance of a major storm at high latitudes, but it's not gonna last all that long because there's just not a very big pocket of fast solar wind. So if you're gonna catch it, it looks like the best time to catch it will be right around the 20th, but then things will definitely calm down reasonably quickly. Now also at mid latitudes, we're expecting unsettled to possibly active conditions with up to about a 10% chance of a minor storm, but likely again, you're gonna have to be in the right place at the right time. So it may be a little bit uh, fleeting for you to try to catch it at mid latitude. Nonetheless, as things begin to settle down, don't worry, we have yet another chance when a larger coronal hole rotates into the Earth's strike zone and in around the 24th, aurora photographers, you're going to get another chance to catch some decent aurora. Switching to our solar flare and particle radiation storm outlook over the coming week, everything is back in the green when it comes to big solar flares. We have no big flare players on the Earth-facing disk, which makes uh, GPS users, you should be very happy because we have no risk for radio blackouts this week. And that is great news because it means your GPS reception, especially in those hurricane uh, devastated areas where you're doing search and rescue, you shouldn't have any issues at all with your reception. Now, amateur radio operators as well. You know, solar flux is also remaining in the triple digits, which means radio propagation on Earth's day side is also in the good range. And now that noise floor has dropped quite a bit because you don't have any of that radio noise from all those active regions on the sun. So enjoy this. This is easily going to last through this week and possibly into next week. And outside of the small solar storms that we're getting on Earth's night side, the disruption on Earth's night side should only be a little bit. So anyone doing radio propagation or radio signals, and this includes space traffic and space launch, you should be in the clear. So the space weather this week remains a bit on the mild side. We do have a coronal hole that's going to be rotating in through the Earth's strike zone in and around the 20th, but it's reasonably small, so the pocket of fast wind that it's going to send us is not going to last all that long. Aurora photographers, if you're at high latitudes, you could get a show right around the 20th. At mid latitudes, well, it's kind of a little dicey whether you're going to see much at all. But if you do happen to miss the show at mid latitudes, well, we do have that larger coronal hole that's going to rotate into the Earth strike zone right around the 24th, and that could send us some fast solar wind, so you could get another chance that might be a bit better. So just hang on. Now, amateur radio operators and emergency responders, while well, things are looking great right now for you, activity has really died down on the uh, Earth-facing disk, and this means that we don't have to worry about radio blackouts, and we don't have to worry about a lot of radio noise from these active regions. So radio propagation looks really good for you on Earth's day side and it looks to have a really good signal to noise. So enjoy because this could last easily over this next week. Now GPS users, you know what? The same thing for you. To, the, to a great degree, we've got a really good GPS reception on Earth's day side and really outside of the small solar storming that we might be getting on Earth's night side over the next couple days, as long as you stay away from Aurora and stay away from those dawn dust terminators, everything should be top notch. I'm Tam of the Scove, the Space Weather Woman. Thank you for watching. Bring up the fader. Alrighty then. Uh, one, two, one, two. Make sure that doesn't clip because uh, it always distorts there on the YouTube. I've noticed if I have that level too high. Thanks, Timotha, for your uh, space uh, weather report, which is fairly current. Uh, so all very good stuff. And, um, um, and just in case you uh, didn't know, Timotha is a radio operator. Uh, her call sign is WX6SWW. How appropriate, space weather woman. <laughs> WX6SWW. Look her up on QRZ.com. Uh, all right, space weather. Just quickly going into uh, spaceweather.com, uh, and uh, I have the disk of the sun here. All righty then. Um, <clears throat> the sol solar wind is currently at three hundred and fifty-seven point nine kilometers per second, at a density of eight point six eight protons per cubic centimeter. 
the current optical, the current uh, disc of the sun has two sunspots on it at the moment, um, apparently. Uh, although, okay, just a sec, let me have a look at this. What have I done? Just refresh the page here. I think I've got the wrong graphic up there. Yes, I have. So that's probably last week's graphic. Oh, I'll just go back to me briefly. Suffice to say, <laughs> if you go to spaceweather.com, the current disk of the sun as of today, right now, there are two sunspots, 3127 and 3126 um, labelled. So uh, uh, current sunspot number is 33, and the radio sun uh, is currently hovering at around uh, the uh, uh, 116 solar flux units, it measured at a wavelength of 10.7 centimetres. Um, at uh, 116 solar flux units and there is an incoming solar wind stream uh, oh yeah I see okay just seeing where I am uh, incoming solar wind stream it's a minor <coughs> a minor G1 class uh, geomagnetic storms uh, are possible on October 24 uh, when a fast-moving stream of solar wind is expected to hit the Earth's magnetic field, the gaseous material is flowing from a southern hole in the sun's atmosphere. A high-latitude sky watchers should be able to uh, will be alert for auroras early in the week. And uh, one other thing, uh, uh, some of you might be aware that there was a, um, a spacecraft called Lucy uh, doing a quick flyby uh, past Earth um, uh, last weekend and um, there's a graphic I've got here of uh, the uh, path that Lucy took around the earth it's a you can only see this in high definition on the YouTube channel because it's got uh, fine graphics and um, you really need good HD to see these uh, fine details in this graphic um, courtesy of spaceweather.com um, the asteroid that wasn't an asteroid last week on October 16, NASA's Lucy uh, spacecraft, apparently named from the song, Beatles song Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds, for some reason, um, NASA's Lucy spacecraft made an atmosphere skimming flyby of our planet. It didn't come alone. Hours before Lucy arrived, another object buzzed Earth only a few hundred kilometres above our planet's surface. Astronomers thought it was an asteroid and named it 2022 UQ1. And what's on the screen right now is the flyby tra tra trajectories of Lucy and 2022 UQ1. Um, and they're all very, very close to each other here, it seems. Uh, one second thought, uh, it wasn't an asteroid at all. Amateur astronomer Bill Gray and, and NASA engineer David Van Nochia took a closer look at 2022 Q, UQ1's orbit and realised it matched Lucy's old Centaur booster rocket. Uh, they've been travelling through space in tandem since Lucy launched a year ago. <laughs> The Minor Planet Center at Harvard University quickly retracted the asteroid designation. Uh, although Lucy and the Centaur flew past Earth at similar distances, their flybys were on opposite sides of the planet, so their orbits were, were bent in different directions. Lucy gained a momentum. Um, Lucy gained momentum and hurled out, out towards Jupiter. Lucy is on a mission to study Jupiter's Trojan asteroids. The Centaur, on the other hand, turned towards the inner solar system for a perithelion between Mercury and Venus. It will be near Earth again on November 8, 2024. Stay tuned for Space Junk. And I'm sorry this is going over time. Um, there's another part of this uh, spaceweather.com thing. Um... Okay, this is uh, the next thing down. Um, Venus, and this is all on spaceweather.com, Venus and the streamers. Venus is passing the sun this week as it heads for superior solar conjunction on 22nd of October. Today it is arc seconds away from a bright polar streamer, is the way they're calling it. So... <coughs> Uh, streamers are magnetic loops merging from the surface of the sun. 
The solar wind stretches them into long, narrow structures with pointy tips. Uh, there are five streamers in today's coronagraph image. Streamer 1, pointing almost directly toward Venus, has roots near the Sun's North Pole. And that's what we're seeing on the graphic here. Uh, this image tells us something interesting about the solar cycle. Uh, during solar minimum, streamers merge primarily from the Sun's e e uh, e equator, giving the Sun a Saturn-like appearance. At solar maximum, however, streamers can pop up anywhere, uh, turning the solar disk into a porcupine of plasma quills. And uh, today's sun looks more like a porcupine, signaling that solar max is on its way, and uh, solar flare alerts, and all that sort of stuff. So that's what's happening there. <laughs> All right, I'll just uh, a, a couple other quick graphics because I like to in include this now with my solar report here with the space weather thingy. Uh, what you're seeing there on the screen is the current auroral um, uh, ring over Antarctica, over the South Pole. Um, so uh, there is uh, auroral activity, but it's re reasonably weak and uh, probably not really visible even from the south coast of Tasmania there. Um, but uh, there is, uh, there's, there's always uh, some sort of auroral activity, activity over the South Pole um, in most cases. And, of course, uh, this image too... Hang on, with my vMix program? And, of course, this is the latest uh, for our solar um, uh, cycle report. So the, the top is the sunspot number and the bottom is the radio uh, flux uh, number. And you can see how they're... They're matching each other pretty much uh, um, chart for chart. And you can see that we're still, even though the the, uh, the peak is uh, rapidly uh, rising, we're still uh, about a year or so away from uh, reaching our, our maximum peak for the, our this current cycle, 25. Okay, having said all that, um, I think uh, we'll leave it there uh, on saying that um, uh, as of the first, as the as of the as of the 21st of October. 2022, uh, there were 2,300 potentially hazardous asteroids. So, <laughs> so um, that figure is growing. All right, on that note, it's uh, 14 minutes past the hour. Thank you for hanging in there, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. And uh, uh, we shall conclude our transmissions for tonight. I want to thank uh, Don and Ian for their emails that have come through on today's uh, 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 session. And um, everybody that I can see up there on the chat window, uh, Kim, VK5FUSE, uh, Robert, VK3XRA. Um, 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 there's also a VK3MSG, who I think is the first time uh, he's come up on the chat window. Cassiopeia, g'day Nebs. And uh, we also have... Um, Brian, uh, Brett, VK2CBD, and um, Uncle Mike, VK3XL, a local lad. Uh, and uh, I think there's a better, including Richard, VK3VRS. So thanks, uh, everybody, for coming up on the screen and the image there on the on the wall there, Rob. It's cool. And <laughs> um, and I'm, I'm just hope the uh, all the graphics that we came, showed t tonight came across very well um, indeed. It's very much a one-man show here, so uh, um, it, uh, it gets fiddly when uh, I've got lots of pictures that I want to show with the articles that I'm, I'm putting up and at the same time concentrate on <laughs> where I've left because as soon as I, I change pictures on the screen here, I, I lose my spot on the article I'm reading from and it gets a bit of a trick to go back. Once I've got the, the graphic on the screen, then I've got it back to the article. And I think, where was I? Where was I? So half the time I, I, I stuff myself up. So you have to forgive me for that too, apart from not being able to pronounce things. But that's just all the fun of it. <sighs> Anyways, very soon I'll be moving studios. This is Studio 2. So uh, I plan to uh, build a Studio 3. <laughs> And in the process, I hope to uh, be able to streamline my operating desk here so that it's not as cluttered as it is. And uh, and hopefully uh, dedicate a corner to the studio to uh, to the Friday night session to make it a little bit more easier for me. 
And I, I tell you, the thing that will be uh, handy is every time, every Friday night that I come up here to do this broadcast from my upstairs studio, I've got a spiral staircase that I climb. And this spiral staircase, which most people that listen to me have been here and have seen it, uh, <laughs> it's very rickety. Every month a screw falls out. And uh, I, I thought with... with um, Usually with about five minutes uh, to, to go, I'm, I'm going downstairs to make a cup of coffee and, and a glass of water, which is this guy here. And uh, I, I step onto this rickety Paris spiral staircase with one, a cup of coffee in one hand and the glass in my other hand. So I, I have to lean into the center of the spiral staircase to keep me steady as I'm, I, I take these little triangle steps up to the, the, uh, to the second floor here. And uh, if I'm not careful, sometimes I'm, well, I do spill coffee. I try not to, though. Uh, that will all change by moving to the new studio. Um, I won't need to be climbing any more steps. So <laughs> it'll be just straight out of the kitchen into uh, into the, the new shack area. So I'm, I'm looking forward to getting that all sorted out uh, in hopefully over Christmas, actually. All right, um, I'll be back next week to do it all again. Uh, next Friday at 10 o'clock, it will be um, the 28th. So we'll be coming into a, a, a new month. Uh, but the, I won't be doing a cast on the 4th of, um, on the 4th of November. Um, I'm having that Friday off. Um, this uh, something that I've got, I've got uh, otherwise engaged and uh, I'll let you guys know that uh, the following week, in fact. But um, uh, the 4th of November, I won't do a cast. But uh, I'll be back. I will be here next week anyway. Just thought I'd throw that in. But I'll m mention it again next uh, next Friday. On that note, my linear uh, FL2100Z is just about catching fire because I'm, I've been running AM for so long on uh, 1865. It doesn't like AM. So uh, I shall turn off the AM medium wave service and uh, I'll pick up any stations that are still around on 80 metres for a quick call back. So stand by, stations, if there's any stations on 80, if you haven't all fallen asleep. This is VK3EKH, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria with the regular broadcast going since 1988. <laughs> is concluding uh, transmissions on 1865 kilohertz and um, saying to a very pleasant good evening to anybody who's listening to the AM transmission. Uh, this is VK3 EKH uh, clear on 1865. Standby stations on 3541. All right, so uh, that's uh, poor old linear and the, the finals in the Pro, th Pro 3 cooling down. Oh dear. So, okay, now getting pencil and log. <sighs> oh, what's that sticky? Something sticky there. Um, this is VK3EKH listening on 3541 for any stations wishing to check in. Now, hang on a sec before I do. Oh, I'll have to select the speaker. I think so. No, it didn't work. Oh my god. I've got one speaker between two radios. I mean, how irritating is that? All right, VK3, EKH listening, 3541. Okay, we've got VK3, JR and VK3, VIN. Any other stations? VK3, SPX, yes. Anybody else? So, so that's what happens. <laughs> oh, get rid of these headphones. Um, this is why what happens when I, I go past the hour. <laughs> I'm really, I really do try to stick to 60 minutes, but it's not important. It's not, it's not, not like there's another another program straight after me. Oh, headphones. I've been wearing headphones for a whole hour. It's just horrible. All right. Uh, have a say, Frank. VK3JR, VK3EKH. Uh, 
Yeah, good on you, Frank. VK3, JR, VK3, EKH. Yes, he's, um, he's pretty much uh, a night owl too um, when, he's, when he does his, uh, his test transmissions there on 160. So I, I, I acknowledge that totally. Never mind. Anyway, thanks, uh, Frank. Good signal from you. 20 over 9 tonight and uh, coming through loud and clear. Not a problem at all. Uh, okay, Ian, VK3, VIN, VK3, EKH. Yeah, no worries, Ian. VK3 VIN, VK3 EKH with VK3 CSJ on the microphone. No worries, uh, Ian. And uh, yeah, well, I can I can tell you that um, uh, Tamitha is uh, uh, always a, a well dressed uh, uh, lady. I'm not sure her age. I don't know whether I should take a stab in the dark on that. Um, but um, I would say that she's probably in her late 20s, early 30s, I'll say. She's a redhead. Um, she's... What was that? Oh. <laughs> okay. Apparently she's in her 50s, so I've, uh, I've done well to guess her age. Um, and uh, she's got long flowing red hair, and, uh, um, and that's about all I'll go on that. <laughs> Uh, but she's a, a smart lass and uh, definitely likes um, uh, everything to do with the sun. So um, she's uh, quite engaging on that because, uh, like I said last week, she's uh, um, if you um, join her um, information uh, site, webpage or whatever you want to call it, as a patron, um, she's, uh, she runs these hour-long sessions uh, and she's uh, she'll get quite a few people uh, coming in and, and watching her uh, and listening to what she has to say and of course the questions get asked and things get answered um, but they go for well over an hour so um, it's uh, quite intriguing enough of that but anyway uh, when she does the dedicated solar reports that run for anywhere between six ten minutes I, uh, I grab them and uh, I always cross fingers that the uh, the data that she's got to talk about, um, is uh, still um, relevant to the, our current time uh, for the next, uh, i.e., for the next couple of days or so, uh, which works. Uh, 
anyway uh thanks ian and uh good to hear you and hopefully very very soon you'll be able to pick up a uh, a signal on 160 meters <laughs> All right, uh, cross to Stephen, VK3SPX, and I think you've had some decent storms out there this evening with lots of lightning and thunder. VK3SPX, VK3EKH. Yeah, good on you, Steve. VK3 SPX, VK3 EKH. Yes, it's interesting, isn't it? It'd be, be uh, certainly interesting to uh, uh, to get a more detailed report uh, in time because their um, uh, their their main aim at the moment ha has been to see whether the the orbit has been altered, uh, and they've been able to measure that. So, which is really interesting how they can do that. Uh, but certainly, what's been in, 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 uh, has impressed them is the fact that there's uh, the, these. Uh, couple of tails uh, has uh, the, the asteroids actually generated so uh, yeah I think you're right I think the the impact has left a, a few interesting questions which are, uh, will be answered in in due course and um, and uh, hopefully the scenario uh, is that um, because of our impact and our meddling with uh, objects like asteroids uh, that we haven't actually caused a situation to occur where this asteroid ultimately does impact Earth at some point in the future uh, as a result of our undoings, our unfortunate things. Anyway, but that's not going to happen. It won't happen. So, uh, <laughs> one of those things. You could they, Hollywood could easily make a movie on it. Um, anyway, all right. Uh, thanks, uh, Stephen. Good, uh, good to hear you. And uh, twenty over nine too, so not a bad signal. Is there anybody else wishing to call in tonight? VK three EKH. Hi, Hi. Hi. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, G'day, Tony. You're, you're a little bit off frequency to me. Um, you're not uh, not on spot on frequency, but I will put you down anyway as calling in. Thanks, Tony. No worries. All right, uh, on that note, I shall pull the plug. Um, it's half past the hour, so uh, I don't think there's anything else there to mention. So this is VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria with the regular Friday night broadcast. Concluding transmissions for tonight on 3541 kHz um, and the YouTube stream, which hasn't failed, uh, Kim VK5 FUSC has mentioned that his YouTube channel has dropped out. Uh, as far as I know, Kim, I'm still streaming, so uh, the I've still got a red indication up on the screen here. So, as far as I know, I'm still streaming, and uh, I think I'm okay. So, um, uh, it might be uh, might be your end. <laughs> Um, so cheers to everybody up there on the chat window. Uh, VK3XEO has just called in. Um, and uh, no worries, XO. Um, my, my novice call sign used to be NCO, non-commissioned officer. You're an XO, like an executive officer. Uh, <laughs> anyway, um, but uh, all very good. And uh, again, thanks for the emails too from uh, Don and uh, Ian as well. On that note, cheers everyone, take care, have a, a, a dry weekend, take care and um, uh, we'll see you next Friday. 
this is VK3 EKH ASV Radio uh, concluding our service for tonight. Cheers everyone. Uh, VK2 uh, X, I think it was Extra Charlie Oscar, Oscar. yes go ahead uh, VK2 Charlie Alpha Bravo um, I don't think you're uh, no you're not okay <laughs> um, alright yeah VK2 CAB I think you said you're somewhere up near Sydney um uh, we can hear you. I'll, I'll give you a report on the next round, uh, but uh, not not uh, not super strong. But you you are getting through. VK two C A B VK three E K um, E K H. Yeah, VK two C A B VK three E K H. Yeah, the name is Clint Charlie Lima India November Tango. Uh, Clint is the name, and location is Narry Warren South. Narry Warren South, about forty kilometres southeast of Melbourne. Uh, my call sign uh, is VK three C S J. In fact, um, VK three Charlie Sierra Juliet is the home call sign, which I'll uh, now use. In fact. Um, but uh, I have been using VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, VK3 EKH, which is the official call sign belonging to the Astronomical Society of Victoria. So I'm, I'm just finishing up with the uh, the broadcast that I do every Friday. So um, your readability about readability 4 to 5, readability 4 to 5, and um, uh, peaking around 10 over. So, um, uh, yeah, a bit... Uh, bit a little bit of noise on the band tonight, c- competing some lightning crashes, but uh, uh, you, at least you're coming through reasonably well, I think. Um, didn't quite catch your name. VK2CAB, VK3EKH, uh, CSJ, sorry. Oh, okay, Rob. Thank you very much, Lee. Um, yeah, VK two CAB, VK three CSJ. Charlie Sierra Juliet is the home call sign. Uh, Robin, VK three CSJ, VK three Charlie Sierra Juliet. Just uh, check up on QRZ.com. That'll explain it. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. So, like, like I say, uh, every Friday night I, I do a broadcast on AS on. Um, on 80 meters uh, on behalf of the Astronomical Society of Victoria so you've you've just caught me towards the uh, the end of the session tonight um, I, I start at 10 o'clock normally so uh, anyway uh, all very good well you're getting down here despite lightning crashes and, and uh, general interference um, you definitely seem to be getting out uh, reasonably well uh, VK2 CAB VK3 CSJ Charlie Sierra Juliet oh boy Yeah, okay. Um, well, it seems to be working for you okay. Um, the uh, the radio here is a uh, Pro 3, an ICOM 756 Pro 3, IC 756 Pro 3, and uh, uh, we're uh, using a, a linear with this too, so we're, we're up around the 400 watt mark through the FL200B. But, uh, okay, Robin, not a problem. I think there was another station that called in uh, just, just before you came on, so uh, we'll see who the other station is. So go ahead. I think it was a VK6, actually. Um, uh, who was the other station that called in? VK3 CSJ.
Okay, VK6ATB, we got you. Um, uh, not, uh, not, not a bad signal at all actually coming across uh, here. Um, okay, VK6ATB. Uh, again, the name here is Clint, Charlie Lima, India, November Tango. Clint is the name, location, Nary Warren. And um, uh, you see, yeah, you're actually getting across quite well. I'll, I'll give you a signal report on the next round. VK6ATB, I think it's Justin. Uh, VK six ATB VK three CSJ. Yeah, Roger, did you say your name was Trevor? Trevor uh, QSL? Yeah, right, Trevor. VK6 uh, ATB, VK3 CSJ. No, okay, Trevor, no worries at all. Um, yeah, about 15. Um, but yeah, around about 10, 15 over 9 uh, coming through. So uh, uh, not uh, not uh, too bad at all. Um, like I say, I, I'm running the, uh, the 756 Pro 3. And uh, with the uh, FL twenty one hundred B linear behind us, so uh, we're up around the four hundred watt mark at the moment, into a inverted V inverted V dipole, um, which is uh, uh, being supported by a, a fourteen meter Nelly tower. So uh, not uh, not too bad at all. Um, thanks, Trevor, for uh, for uh, coming in and, and checking as well. Like I say, I'm just about to finish up here. I've uh, been uh, running since uh, 10 o'clock, so <laughs> um, time to rest the voice. But uh, it's good to know that I'm getting, I think you said 20 over 9, so I'm glad that I'm a pretty good signal into, uh, into Western Australia. So not too bad at all. Excellent stuff. Thanks, Trevor. VK6ATB, VK3CSJ. Yeah, good on you there, Trev. VK six ATB, VK three EKH. Not a problem. That's a, a decent antenna that you're uh, using there, and it's definitely working for you. That's uh, that's for sure. Um, I, I usually come up on 160 as well when I do the broadcast. I uh, uh, I, I have a, a simulcast uh, transmission um, on 1865, but I, I generally run AM. Uh, so, uh, but I, I I use a vertical antenna for uh, for 160. So uh, it'd be interesting to see if I ever, ever get, if the signals uh, ever gets across to uh, to uh, Western Australia. So maybe um, maybe next week have a listen out. <laughs> anyway, never mind. Thanks, Trevor. Thanks very much for uh, for calling in there. It's excellent. And uh, thanks to you there, Robin, for also uh, coming back as well. Uh, VK six ATB VK three CSJ is uh, listing the frequency. He's not. <laughs> All right, I'll leave the VK two and the VK six to try and uh, share signal reports. Um, not not the strongest of signals, but. It's it's pretty cool when you get a a contact coming in from Western Australia on uh, on 80 meters um, at this uh, time of the night, uh, which is not, nothing unusual for 80 meters, uh, three and a half megs propagation across the the continent is quite possible, and uh, particularly this time of the year, uh, it's uh, it's good. 80 meters covers most of Australia, 
and out to New Zealand, Tasmania, and uh, even sometimes uh, overseas into uh, into the west coast of America. Sometimes. Anyway, for those that are still watching the YouTube channel and trying to stay awake, that's fine. <laughs> um, yeah, so catching up with Brian Cox was really good. Pity I didn't meet him in person, though. I would have got a selfie if I had a chance, but that wasn't going to be. But anyway, it was great to, to see Brian uh, in the flesh. So there it is. All right. Um, cheers, Nebs. Uh, Richard and uh, Kim and everybody else that's up there on the chat window. Uh, thank you for joining in. So on that note, I shall say very good evening at um, 17 minutes to midnight here in Melbourne. And uh, the temperature is currently... 18, 18 degrees, 18.6 degrees outside, cloudy and potentially rainy. Uh, hopefully we won't to get flooded out like we did last week. Uh, we have too much rain coming off the property next door and it, it floods at the back end of the barn. We have no drainage and we have, oh, we've been here for 11 years and we continue to have drainage problems. So hopefully we can get that sorted out very soon. Uh, I'm disappearing. So I bid everybody a very pleasant good evening from VK3CSJ here in Narry Warren. And uh, don't forget to listen out for uh, Chris Long, VK3AML's session tomorrow night on YouTube. Look out for VK3AML and the live symbol on YouTube. He runs between 9.30 and midnight and uh, has very uh, educational material that he shows. Cheers for now. And the audio. Kill the audio, Clint. All right, I'm going to kill the audio.